Hello, everybody. A warm welcome. Namaskar to all of you. Hope you are all uh, doing good. Very good. And as promised, I am Tanaya back again with all of you with yet another conversation brought to you from the house of Team Cradle. Thank you so much for joining in. In our sessions so far, uh, in fact, in all our sessions, we have emphasized on the need of having a guru or a spiritual master in our lives. We talked about how having a guru helps us in an overall a holistic development, how it leads us towards life and uh, growth. Give me a moment, please. You know, sometimes it gets difficult because when you're phone, you forget to you know, keep it in the silent mode. I'm so sorry for it. So uh, as I was you know, mentioning uh, that in our sessions so far, we talked about uh, the need of a guru, how having a guru uh, helps us in our life and growth, in our holistic development. Now, uh, uh, we also have talked about the messages, the teachings of different world teachers or spiritual masters. Uh, uh, this time, uh, we will talk about the life and teachings of one such great spiritual master, Shri Shri Thakur Anukul Chandra. Uh, we will talk uh, about what is so special about Shri Shri Thakur. What are his, what are his teachings? What is his central philosophy? Why it is important for us uh, to look at his teachings and reflect? What can we learn from these teachings? Well, and that's why the topic for today's discussion is why Sri Sri Thakur Anukul Chandra. And to discuss uh, the topic with me today, I have a special guest yet again. And this guest is a familiar face uh, for Team Cradle. You have seen him, you have listened to him earlier as well. Well, may I please have him on screen? And I'm sure uh, my audience who have seen the sessions earlier will be able to recognize instantly. Yes, there, uh, right there on your screen is Mr. Uh, Surya Prakash Mahapatra. Uh, he has uh, been in Cradle sessions, in many Cradle sessions as an anchor, as well as a panelist. And uh, by this time, I think he is quite familiar to all of you. We always love interacting with him, don't we? Uh, Mr. Surya is a LND leader, a leader in the LND space, and he's associated currently with one large multinational organization. And again, uh, Mr. Surya, it's my pleasure to host you and engage in a conversation with you. Thank you so uh, much. It's my pleasure too. Thank you. Thank you so much. So uh, without much ado, let me uh, straight away jump uh, to the topic. And the topic for today, as I called out already, is uh, why Sri Sri Thakur and Chandra. And I'm sure my audience would be having uh, so many questions in their mind uh, you know, when they see this topic. One question which definitely will come in people's mind is that there are so many, so much of, you know, spiritual wisdom and abundance, I should say, of spiritual uh, wisdom, yeah, be it in our scriptures, books, or now even in the social media. Then why the need of another spiritual master or a world teacher uh, like Sri Sri Thakur and Chandra? Your thoughts, please. So sure. I think you are absolutely right when you say uh, that there is just so much of spiritual knowledge that exists in this world in the form of books, artifacts, scriptures, and so on. There is abundance, absolutely, there's no doubt. But in this context, I'm reminded of a um, poem by Charles Dickinson from his book, The Tale of Twin, Two Cities. And he writes in the first chapter, it was the best of times, it was the worst of times. It was the age of wisdom. It was the age of foolishness. It was the epoch of belief. It was the epoch of incredulity. It was the season of light. It was the season of darkness. It was the spring of hope. It was the winter of despair. So absolutely, today we have plenty, but we have paucity. Today, uh, there is great wisdom. At the same time, there is humongous amount of foolishness all around. So if you log into the internet 
and type the keyword stress management, you would find millions of blogs, articles, podcasts, videos. There are thousands of stress management coaches providing tips and techniques to deal with stress. In spite of this abundance of knowledge, we see, if you look at the research findings, three out of four employees at organizations are suffering from anxiety and stress and depression. So what is this abundance of knowledge leading us to? So if you look at this, this, you know, this contradiction, this ambiguity, we clearly understand that there is a gap. There is a need for a living ideal or a wall teacher like Sri Siddha Kulunukul Chandra, who can help us take this journey from the darkness to light, the foolishness to wisdom, from despair to hope. There is abundance of knowledge, but this knowledge exists in the form of information and data. But there is so little wisdom that is that exists, because wisdom is, is all about living values, beliefs, and demonstrating the conviction and translating those beliefs and values into action. I think we have abundance of knowledge, but we see very little on the ground in terms of action. Now, the question is, um, in a situation like this, how can we really uh, move out of this hopelessness situation and then and then make this journey towards hope. So if you look at, again, the research findings, we'll see that um, the percentage of educated people committing crime is increasing. The divorce rate among educated population is increasing. We also at the same time see um, that violations, unlawfulness is increasing in the in the educated population. Now, so I think this very clearly tells us that intellect does not drive behavior. Ideology does not drive change. Ideology does not drive change. So now, then what drives this change? What brings about transformation in human life? We will talk about it. And we'll also understand what is what Sri Sri Thakur Anukul Chandra has said and how he has come to us as a panacea of hope in the midst of this hopelessness as we continue this discussion. What a beautiful way to start the discussion, Mr. Surya. And I think you started with uh, uh, that famous uh, quotation from uh, Charles Dickens and then went on to tell us that while uh, there may be a lot of information uh, but information data is definitely different from what wisdom is. Uh, and what we're lacking currently is wisdom. And, and that is why uh, if you look at the society today, you know, there's so much of stress uh, around, you know, be it, in, uh, be it in the form of, you know, marriages getting split or violations or many other. We, we find stress everywhere in you know, all the commodities today. And I was just wondering, you know, today as I was ordering something on Flipkart, that all the commodities are just a click away from us. We need a cab, we, uh, there is Uber, one click away. We need something, there's Flipkart, there is Amazon. But where is happiness? Where is peace? Where is the address? Does the world know today? Uh, and I think, you know, that is where uh, maybe the need of a spiritual master, and we've talked about uh, this aspect in our other sessions as well. And maybe we will deep, uh, we will delve a little deeper today in the discussion in the light of the philosophy of the great spiritual master, Sri Sri Thakur and Kulchandra. Uh, so now what uh, I'm interested to understand from you and you know more so, you know, I'm the ambassador for my audience today. So whatever questions I ask you today, Mr. Surya, are my audience questions, what my audience would be having in their mind today. Okay, when they look at this topic and obviously at the end of the session, uh, they will also get a chance to interact with you, interact with us and ask their questions. But as of now, I'm the representative of my audience. 
So uh, if we look at the philosophy of Sri Sri Thakur, and that is what we are more interested to know today, what is the central idea or the basic theme? What is at the core of Sri Sri Thakur's philosophy? If you can please throw some light and help us understand. Absolutely. Great question. That is a continuation of the first question that you asked me. Yeah, and absolutely. I'm, I'm glad that you asked me this question. Uh, the central philosophy is essentially the most profound one uh, that I'm going to share with you. And uh, let me not try to use my words to explain his philosophy. I will share with you what Sri Sri Thakur Nupun Chandra has said. Once a journalist from the from United States came to Sri Sri Thakur and asked him, Thakur, can you explain your philosophy to me in two words, in just two words? Sri Sri Thakur told him, be concentric. Be concentric means be with the center. Have a center in your life. The journalist asked him, Thakur, be concentric around whom? Sri Sri Thakur Anukul Chandra replied, be concentric around your living ideal. The journalist, Michael James, asked Sri Sri Thakur, oh, okay, so what happens if I am concentric around Henry Ford? Sri Sri Thakur smiled at him and said, yes, if Henry Ford becomes your living ideal, then you can become a Henry Ford, but you cannot become Jesus Christ. The higher is your ideal, the higher is your life. The more elevated is your ideal, the more elevated is your life. If you really want to uplift and elevate your life, expand your life, then you must have the source of expansion as your love center. And that source of expansion is the source himself. So if you have that living ideal at the center of your life, and then you would be able to uplift and elevate your life. So we were in the in response to the first question, we are discussing ideology does not drive change. So then what drives change? The person in whom all the great ideas and ideologies have been embodied. If we accept him as our living ideal at the center of our life, then that can drive change. We also discussed that intellect does not drive change. It does not drive behavior. Intellect does not, there is no positive intellectuals in this world, but they do not live a happy and meaningful life. They do not inspire others to live a happy and meaningful life. Then what drives change? It's love, admiration, and service to your living ideal. That alone drives change in behavior, transformation in personality. So who is that living ideal? That living ideal is the omniscient, omnipotent personality, the most reformed human being the most evolved human being, the most transformed human being, who is manifestation of human perfection. So when you have such a living ideal like Sri Sri Thakur Nukul Chandra, and when you have him at the center of your life, make him your love center, then the journey towards transformation begins because it's the ideologies that you believe in have been embodied in that living ideal. I hope I was able to. No, this is very, very profound. Forward. It is very, very profound. And I think uh, gives us a lot of food for thought because you are saying that ideology does not uh, lead to change, neither does intellect. And we are so full of you know ideas, ideology, intellect all around. Uh, and yet we are in search of happiness. But at the same time, you say that. Uh, in a living ideal in whom uh, we, we see uh, the amalgamation of the ideologies and we have that love, uh, admiration, and not only love and admiration, but active service towards that living ideal. That is when a transformation we see in our lives in the form of character and which gets reflected in our habits. 
right uh, and you know love definitely is at the core of everything because many times right if it is written in a book that don't do this okay say it is written that you know just a simple example say it is written in a book that please do not tell a lie okay so i will read it i i might forget but if somebody whom i love like my father he is saying that please do not tell a lie and i feel that my father will feel hurt if i tell a lie then i will not tell that lie so that way my habit my behavior is getting changed and why it is get changed getting changed because i love my father and i will i feel that my father doesn't want me to do it i should not so love is driving so when love is at the center and here we are talking and while i'm giving the example of father a, a living ideal and you know who is uh, who is so expansive himself right and when you are having love towards him we can only imagine the kind of change and transformation we will have in our uh, life and we are talking about the spiritual master we are talking about a guru to be at the center of our lives absolutely yes. uh so uh, satsang when we look at uh, as an institution and you know which obviously sushi thapu himself founded uh, we always hear it as a men making institution and sushi thapu has emphasized uh, on men making men remaking and that is what when you talk about character building as you talked about in the last uh, as a response to the last two questions uh, it is about character building you know men making as i understand okay and uh, so how how do you think you know what are the basic tenets of men making and men remaking uh, in line with the ideology of shri thakur oh that's a great question i'm really happy that your questions are you know um, all linked uh, to the previous questions i'm i'm just trying to pick your thoughts from what you are mentioning in your in your responses and this is trying to you know pick from the same thread and carry Absolutely. it on uh, mr surya yeah so we talked about human transformation we talked about transformation in personality character behavior and that's pretty much linked to man making and when you talk about man making and if you look at the contemporary society today the scientists today are doing adequate research on how to breed pedigree dogs how to breed great horses great cows but what about bringing great human beings to this world that's where lies the essence of man making the famous nobel laureate alex scarrell says the man of science has forgotten the science of man how profound is this statement the man of science in this scientific in the age of scientific advancement has forgotten the science of man sri sri thakur nukul chandra has brought us the science of man how to breed how to breed bring great human beings to this world and there lies the fundamental ideology of sri thakur which talked about be concentric so if we, we if you are concentric around the living ideal and that's where the man making process can begin man making begins before the man is born so you know it's like uh, you know when we talk about um, uh, eugenics it's all about bringing superior human beings to this earth so we know that human beings are the most superior they are the supreme species on the earth but the question is do human beings realize their true potential human beings are born with unlimited infinite potential but what happens to majority of human beings sri sri thakur anukul chandra says every human being is unique every human being has some distinct qualities and he calls them by sisters or instincts inborn instincts and he says uh through genetics every human being acquires those special characteristics and special qualities but if the system of marriage is not compatible then we might lose some of those distinctiveness 
that existed or you know with our forefathers i think we'll talk more about ideal marriage etc um, uh, you know subsequently but now the instincts or distinctiveness with which the man is born often man does not recognize that his parents do not recognize that and that's where the problem happens that's where is the need of a living ideal who is omniscient who is omnipotent who is the most reformed human being who has understood the science of man we need such a man who can bring that science who can help us understand our distinctive qualities who can help parents understand the distinctive unique qualities of their children and that is the beginning of man making if that does not happen if if a, if man does not understand what his distinctiveness what is distinct unique qualities are inborn instincts are he or she is never going to flourish he is he or she is never going to grow and display those qualities so this living ideal that i'm talking about the 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 world the the life teacher is also known as the fulfiller of the instinct instincts so he can identify he can help you identify and recognize your distinctiveness and he can also help you grow and develop and sharpen your instincts and if a man achieves that man making becomes so simple you know it, it's it, transformation of human beings is become so simple yeah absolutely and uh, you know it when you talked about uh, sir alexis carroll you know one poem uh, came to mind i think that was wordsworth who wrote in one of his famous poems i think that was human seasons or something saying that you know have i not reasons to lament what man has made of man and you know i thought it's you know quite connects uh, with uh, what he has told that uh, we have forgotten that science of man making another thing which you are talking about here very strongly is that the living ideal is uh, is fulfilled the best and he is able to uh, help us realize our instincts the unique uh, the unique instincts or the uniqueness we are born with the infinite potential we are born with and help helps us realize it and helps us align those strengths or instincts accordingly brings one story to mind and correct me mr surya if i go wrong because you know more about shrishi thakur his life and teachings more than i do uh, so i i heard that story that once uh, a, a mother used to come to shrishi thakur and used to complain that my son does not study he only watches movies he only watches movies and obviously parents do not like kids are wearing uh, you know watching movies and that was the complaint of that mother so shishi thakur uh, used to tell that kid that okay fine you watch movies you know please go watch movies and you know tell me the stories you know what you watch so so the kid obviously he had to come and tell thakur shishi thakur the stories so obviously he started watching good movies because otherwise he would feel very embarrassed you know telling those stories you know to thakur then uh, you know days passed that way you know he used to come tell uh, shishi thakur the stories shishi thakur used to you know enjoy those stories and then shishi thakur started telling him that please start you know writing those stories what you understand of the stories and keep on reading out to me and you know same uh, the kid used to do and eventually by doing this the writing capability and everything in, because his instinct was aligned in that direction okay and shrishi thakur helped him realize that and i think eventually that uh, that uh, kid grew up to make it big in the film industry so i have forgotten the names and the characters here but this is the essence of the story that was there so i thought maybe you know it is something which you and i wanted to connect it to you yes this is a true story yes and this is how fulfiller the best or the living ideal helps uh, you know help this child identify his a uh, true instincts and true potential and not only helped him identify also he helped him grow and develop that and make it really big in his life and and profession absolutely absolutely so, so i think another you know uh, so would you like to please you know elaborate more on the men making part because you talked about marriage and i'm sure apart from marriage there are other parts as well so you know if you can right. please touch upon it and then maybe in the later part i will definitely ask you questions you know as i pick your thoughts and try to get more out of you to learn more about 
Sri Sri Thakur and his philosophy. Yes, yes, I can talk about it. So Sri Sri Thakur has talked about biological efficiency or biological superiority. You know, and then he says biological superiority is the result of your biological makeup. The biological makeup is what we what we get through the process of birth, right? So the bi biological makeup is destroyed, then biological superiority cannot be achieved, right? So that's why he has emphasized marriage a lot, but we'll talk about it a little later. Now, when he talks about biological superiority, he talks about two things. We have already discussed about instincts, which is which are basically the distinct qualities that we inherit from our parents through genes. Sri Thakur is also talking about another set of traits. He has talked about nine traits. He says if a human being possesses those nine traits, he can become really great in his life or her life. And everybody has those nine traits. But the question is, to what extent? Uh, Thakur has um, listed out those, those uh, traits. Uh, these are admiration towards superior willpower, adherence to the living ideal, tendency towards unity, presence of mind, sympathy, power of resistance, cautious inquisitiveness, and intelligence. These are the nine traits that each one of us has, but you know, to what measure, to what extent? You know, if a man has great willpower, great presence of mind, great inquisitiveness, admiration towards elders and superiors, adherence to living ideal, has the power of resistance and intelligence. He doesn't have to worry about it. But today we see many people in this world who lack willpower, who lack sympathy, who lack presence of mind. Who, who are extremely talented people, but they lack love and empathy. Extremely talented, but they cannot work with other people. They cannot achieve unity and collaboration. Admiration towards elders is such a, such a powerful trait which is missing. And inquisitiveness and intelligence and power of resistance. Power of resistance is ability to deal with obstacles in life. Sister Thakur is saying, Man evolves through the through his or her interaction with the environment. Environment gives us impulses, and we respond to every impulse that we receive from the environment. And our ability to respond to the impulse. If somebody talks to me nicely, I, I talk to that person nicely in return. But somebody is scolding me. I don't know how to deal with what how I should respond. I end up getting into a conflict. So ability to respond to impulses from environment, that is the true ability. And right from our childhood, infancy, because education is one of the important pillars, as Thakur has talked about. The education of the child begins right from his or her infancy. When he or she starts observing the world around him or her through his sense organs. And whatever he receives through his sense organs are impulses and stimuli from the environment. And who, who gives him the first impulse? The mother. And the father, then the immediate family members. And through their conduct and behavior, child learns how to respond. Because if the child sees his father not treating his mother properly, that's what he learns. If the child sees that his parents do not respect their parents, that's what he learns. That's He knows that this is how I need to respond. That's how his learning becomes cemented. By the time he comes to the school, his destiny has already been decided. His future has already been decided. So the essence of man making then lies in ideal marriage thereafter ideal education and ideal education before it starts in the school it has to start at home 
And the nine qualities that I talked about, admiration to superiors, sympathy, adherence, willpower, presence of mind, inquisitiveness. Um, then I talked about intelligence. Those qualities develop as the child learns to receive impulses and respond to impulses. For example, the power of resistance, because we receive obstacles and challenges from the environment all the time. It's our power of resistance helps us overcome those challenges. So the way parents prepare the child through their own conduct, behavior, and mannerisms, that's how the, they shape the destiny of the child. Small carelessness can impact the child's destiny. Acharya Dev Srisri Dada was sitting at the Nat Mandap. Many devotees were sitting uh, surrounding him. There was a small child who was playing in front of the Nat Mandap. The child fell down. The mother was standing nearby. The child started crying non-stop. The mother tried to console him. The child was not willing to stop. The mother then said, Son, listen, this floor has given you pain. You fell down on the floor. Floor has given you pain. I am now going to thrash the, pay, the floor. Then she started hitting the floor with a stick. Started hitting the floor again and again and again. Child within no time became silent and quiet. Because the child probably realized that revenge has been taken. The floor gave me punishment. Now the floor has been penalized. Acharya Dev Siddhada was observing this. He called the mother and he told in a reassured tone, Mother, whatever you did today, never ever repeat that again. Through this action, you have planted the seed of revenge in your child. Today he learns that if he receives pain, he has to give pain in return. If somebody hurts him, he has to hurt him back in return. If he receives harm from somebody, he has to give harm. The seed of revenge has been planted in him. See how sometimes parents, instead of taking the child on the path of transformation, progress, evolution, and elevation, can damage the progress of the child. This is a huge subject. I think we can talk about talk for hours See, together on this philosophy of Sri on man making because he has taught us the science of man. Sri Thakur has emphasized, as you said rightly, on the right marriage and obviously the right parenting. And especially, you know, there is a book called Women's The Women's Code, uh, which I read. Uh, and you know, people can search it up, I think, in our satsang page itself. Uh, grab a copy. It's, it's written for uh, women, because uh, our Srishi Thakur considered we women as very, very special. And he said that, you know, a mother is so important uh, to uh, a child, the education of the child. And he said that you are the you're the basis of the education of the child. You, are the fo you form the foundation. And so it is so important, you know, for you to do it right. And he, in one of his messages, he said that when the star child starts blabbering, and I think uh, that would be the age of around one and a half to two years. I think from that age, he has told us that whatever you teach that child from that age, when he starts blabbering, you know, uh, start speaking, speaking little, little, that will become the main, you know, uh, the primary in your child at a later point in time. And if you remember, and my audience also, uh, if they have watched this session on education that we did uh, with Mr. Biplab Loho Chaudhary, uh, I think a few months back, he also talked so much about childhood education and he's, he specifically talked about that the neurons get formed uh, inside uh, uh, the, most of the neurons by the age of seven to 10, okay? And after that, you know, whatever you teach by the child, uh, the child up to that age, you know, stays on because your neurons are all formed. So that's why parenting and childhood education is so very important. And many times we miss out on those you know, important aspects. And that's why we are not able to create good human beings, uh, create and nurture good human, human beings. And I think a brilliant example you gave, you know, and many times we see that happening, you know, hitting the floors when the, the kid 
uh, falls down. But what a beautiful message out there. Uh, and when you are talking about those nine qualities, uh, Mr. Surya, I was like, you know, thinking about the leadership competencies, which we so much talk about these days in the corporates. Okay, increased, uh, you know, curiosity, uh, then empathy, and many of those, right? But then obviously, we miss out on many things like that ad admiration for a living ideal. Uh, and yeah. that's why maybe we are not able to, you know, at, at a, as a society, we are not able to, you know, get to that level. While obviously we create leaders, we create great professionals, so we, we work, you know, on building those competencies. But I think if we focus on these nine qualities right from the start, uh, right from uh, the childhood itself, we definitely would Absolutely. be able to go a long way in terms of making good human beings. And we are all responsible, responsible and accountable both for the same. Uh, so good. I think the discussion is going go, go good. Uh, we are learning more uh, from you, uh, Mr. Surya, uh, more about uh, the teachings and philosophy of Shri Thakur. And I think all of us uh, need to reflect as we listen to the discussion. It is not only about you know listening, going back, forgetting. It is about reflection at every step. And only when we listen uh, and listen to understand I can always listen to respond back, but when I listen to understand, listen to reflect, and that is when my listening you know, gets all the more meaningful and I'm able to imbibe some of the things in my actions, in my behavior, in my habits. So uh, in my last, in the response to my last question, uh, I think you mentioned about uh, the environment, individual, the impulse from the environment side, how the individual responds to it. So I would want uh, you to, elaborate more on this because I think these are the three pillars uh, obviously in uh, in what the messages of Shishi Thakur are. So if you can please you know throw some light on this and most importantly help us understand how these three aspects ideal environment and the individual all of us are connected. So that would that would really be helpful. Absolutely. So um you know, when we talk about the three pillars, uh, there are two sets of three pillars. One is um, uh, Diksha, initiation, education, and marriage. These are three fundamental pillars of the human, human life and human transformation. And when we talk about the society at large, transformation of a nation, transformation of the humankind, then we again need three pillars. The three pillars are individual, ideal and environment. You can see uh, me holding a tripod and this tripod has three legs. Yeah, yeah. If it has only two legs, it cannot stand. It Absolutely. needs all the three legs to stand. Similarly, if you don't strengthen the process of initiation, education and marriage, the human being cannot stand. And similarly, in the larger society and mankind in the in the universe if you don't strengthen if you don't have this the synchronization between these three pillars individual ideal and environment this human society the humankind will get devastated it will be on the rocks now um, i will quickly touch upon um, the first set of three pillars and then quickly move to this one. So through the process of initiation, um, a human being becomes concentric around the living ideal. Initiation, Sri Thakur calls, it's, 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 no, it's called Diksha. The, diksh, the word, within the word Diksha, there is the word Daksha, which is efficiency. So efficiency comes through Diksha. Dakshata comes from Diksha. So when we say that somebody has taken initiation, from the living ideal, he or she has been initiated into the clue of an efficient life. That is the true meaning of initiation. That's where the human man-making journey begins and then capability and the nine traits that we talked about, etc. Education only um, evolves those qualities that you know we 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 were we are born with and what we learn from our living ideal. And then the process of marriage brings uh, leads to uh, good progeny, uh, you know, bringing good human beings to the world, and so on. Now, in the in the larger um, humankind, you know, we see we all of us have an individual life, 
and then when we get married then we have a conjugal life when we have children of course we also have our own parents we have family life and when we look at our neighborhood that becomes a social life and then when we look at the larger spectrum that becomes our national or universal life right so sisa thakur talks about this five lives pancha mahajivan every human being has so i i need balance between this five lives my own individual life conjugal life familial life social life and national life if there is incoherence between these five lives suppose um i i remember reading a book uh, uh, by dr rebati mohan biswas who did research on sri thakur and kul chandra's ideology once an ias officer met him and he said i do not agree with the ideology of your guru i do not need an living ideal at the center of my life i am i educated i am well established i am successful i run a, i i am an ias officer i am respected by people in the society i don't need a living ideal i am all right i am absolutely fine dr biswas asked him um mr gupta the name of the ias officer was gupta he said mr gupta when you come back home how often do you meet your wife at home he says well probably 6 out of 7 days i don't meet her she is usually in her kitty parties with her friends or in the in the mall shopping um i do not meet her every day um he asked mr gupta do your children are your children obedient do they obey everything that you say he said no my children are slowly becoming little naughty and then rude i'm little worried about their their behavior and mannerisms dr revati mohan biswas said mr gupta you are successful you are a well established uh, professional you are an ias officer maybe the government of india will give you the padma shri title in near future for your professional excellence but are you a happy man mr gupta was quiet so this story which is a real incident talks about the importance of the coordination between individual fam- uh, conjugal familial social and um national lives and my my wife my family my society my country they form part of my environment i am the individual so yes, how yes. do i live in harmony with my environment how do i stay in harmony i do not get along with my neighbors when i step out of home i don't see them eye to eye i don't look at them we don't exchange greetings when i am at at distress they don't come and help me i don't do the same thing sri so sri thakur anukul chandra is saying your environment is the only source of your nourishment for you don't ignore the environment nurture your environment be serviceable to the environment in one of our cradle webinars if you remember dr shutanu chakravarti was sharing a great example he he was saying if a mosquito sits on your forehead your hand goes and and uh, drives it away if the mosquito comes back again and sits on the forehead your hand goes again and tries to drive it away he says the mosquito comes again the hand goes again he says the hand never asks the mosquito is biting the forehead why should i worry why should i drive away with the mosquito it is not biting me and i am not getting anything from the forehead why should i bother about it but sisa thakur says the hand never says that whenever the hand feels that the human existence is in danger at risk the hand goes and tries to protect the whole human being and if any organ in the existence of the human being is is endangered is de- is at danger every other body organ they promptly get into action to protect that's how 
the human body, human anatomy is based on interdependence. Each organ helps every other organ. The lungs, the heart is dependent on the lungs. The lungs are dependent on the nose. You know, each organ is dependent on other organs and they work in complete harmony with each other. That is interdependence. And that is the essential message for me and my relationship with the environment. But how do I, how do I make sure that I and my friend, I and my wife, I and my children, I and my neighbor have a great harmonious interdependent relationship that is possible only when we only we can become interinterested only when we have a common interest in life. If all of us don't have a common interest, then we cannot be interinterested. So for us to become interinterested, to become interested in each other's welfare, well-being, happiness, we need to have a common interest. And that common interest is the living ideal, the teacher, the guru in life. If you have that common ideal at the center, then the triangle is complete. We have the ideal at the center and then uh, the individual and the environment. I hope I answered your question. Beautiful, I think, you know, and it will stay with us because you showed us the tripod as well, uh, that it is important that both, all the three sides are there for our life to stand, just as a tripod stands on three legs. So it is important that our life also stands on these three pillars and, and wherein, you know, the ideal is uh, at the center and, you know, and we are connected, the environment, and us as individuals are connected to the individual and that's uh, to the ideal. And that's how the triangle of life, of expansion, of growth forms. Absolutely. And if and, in, and the, if in, the if, in the tripod, if one of the legs is not there, then the tripod cannot stand. So in my life, if ideal does not exist, what I'm going to do it only with environment. Absolutely. If Absolutely. And that is why ideal exists, environment exists, I don't exist, then what's the point? And, and very recently, right, you talked about inter interestedness and how having a common ideal, common interest drives all of us. You know, we, we are even now in the midst of a COVID pandemic, right, though it is ebbing, which is a good news for all of us. But we have seen, right, how communities have got formed, how communities have helped each other, you know, come out of the crisis. And especially here, you know, since we're talking about Sushri Thakur and Satsang, and I'm sure that has happened in you know other organizations as well, but I can speak uh, you know, of this because I've seen it on the ground in Bangalore. You know, when people were you know falling sick, people needed to get to hospital, people needed a bed, beds were not ab uh, available. How people you know came together. You know, people are not connected by blood, but they have a spiritual master, they have a guide, they have an, they have a living idol at the center, and that way they're connected to the people around. Absolutely. Okay, and, and by that interest only. People came forward, you know, help. I think, you know, that was complete dedicated work which people did for each other. And having a common ideal at the center helped us do it more, do it with more energy, do it with more enthusiasm. Okay. Absolutely. So I think, you know, well, yeah, yeah, absolutely. And uh, another thing, right, I was recently attending one conference wherein as a special guest, the great chef, you know, he's very popular these days, Mr. Vikas Khanna. He, he came over, he was, uh, uh, he was our special guest. And, uh, and the anchor asked him that, what is the secret of your success? Because currently he's hugely successful. Uh, he has a chain of restaurants across the globe and everything is coming in different uh, shows. So the anchor asked him that, what is the secret of your success? He said that every life has to have a center of gravity. We all have to have a center of gravity. You know, which pulls us, you know, keeps us anchored. And he said that for me, the center of gravity is my mother. Okay. And I, I was so overwhelmed by, you know, hearing this because I could find the connect to uh, the message of Sri Thakur, be concentric. Okay. okay. While in case of Vikas, it was his mother, but we are talking about that, you know, the higher the ideal is, the higher, the more expansive your center is, the more expansive your life becomes. But I could see that connect, which he was saying. So people are increasingly maybe realizing this that it is very important to stay anchored, to have a center in our lives. And that is what we are also trying in doing sessions like this, Mr. Surya, you know, talking about the need of a spiritual master, talking about the need of a guru, talking about the need of a center in our lives, 
And you know, just as you said, that intellect, ideology, ideas, everything may be there, there, but this is not leading to change. This is not leading to human transformation. And uh, and that is where the need of a center and a spiritual guide uh, comes. So thank you, uh, Mr. Surya. I think we talked uh, about the central idea of Sri Thakur's philosophy, and we started with where uh, where the need comes from. Okay, we started with the need. We talked about the uh, central theme in Sri Thakur's teachings. Uh, we talked about initiation, education, and marriage as the three important pillars of that ideology. And you touched upon each of those. Uh, we also talked about how it is important for us to form, a, you know, to be aware and uh, the triangle which you mentioned about the triangle between the ideal individual and uh, the environment and you know, getting connected. And that's what gives our life a balance. And you talked about the Pancha Mahajivan, the, uh, the individual life, family life, society life, uh, conjugal life, and the national life. And again, we are responsible, as Sri Thakur called out, right? That you are responsible for your own, your family, the society, and the nation, the present and the future. So we have to, unless we take actions, unless we align, unless we act, unless we get aligned to a center, you know, all these things will not come in, you know, order, come in balance. Uh, so thank you. And I think I have exhausted my questions at this point in time. Uh, obviously, you know, I want to ask questions, but then, you know, more than the questions, it is the time, uh, which I'm mindful about. So uh, I would like to quickly go to my audience to get some questions from there. And I'm sure there will be many uh, because uh, this was quite an uh, interesting conversation, I should say, uh, Surya. And thank you, Mr. Surya. Thank you for joining us. My pleasure. OK, there's a question from Swati. Sarkar, eugenics, Varnashram, economic development, permanent elevation of poverty. Has Thakurji's ideology correlated this and is that practically practically possible? Right. So this is a great question. So I think um, um, Swati Sarkar has uh, brought out uh, quite a few aspects: eugenics, Panasram, uh, economic development, permanent alleviation of poverty. So let me start with poverty. Sister Thakur and Kulchandra says poverty is not a condition; it is a disease, and this disease can be cured it can be treated so and then thakur says what is the reason why somebody gets this disease so thakur is saying it is our own distorted character which leads to this disease so uh, what are this lacuna in a character which lead to this disease thakur says inferiority complex laziness um blaming others for your own fault not taking initiative, lack of inquisitiveness, all these traits can lead to a disease called poverty. So if you become more efficient, if you give up our laziness and become hardworking, if you stop blaming others for our own faults and for our own situation, and if you stop, being inferior, uh, stop having inferiority complex, then we will be able to overcome will be able to treat this disease called poverty. Now, if we gain these qualities called efficiency, hard work, um, and then empathy, and um, and you know, not blaming others for our own fault, rather you know, uh, helping others and enlisting others' help, collaborating with others, etc. Once our poverty goes away, of course, that leads to economic development if in, if every individual in the society becomes a man or woman of character and with that strong character they remove them they throw away poverty from their lives if everybody collectively becomes uh, you know uh, i'm not saying wealthier but if they can make collectively become economically better off the country will obviously become better off because According to Sri Thakur's ideology, 
if we have a living science ideal at the center of our lives, and if we, that living ideal becomes the common interest for everybody in the society, then everybody will stand up for each other. The rich will help the poor become better off financially. The, ignore, the, the wise will help the ignorant. The strong will help the weak. And obviously, as a nation, as a society, will not only become financially stronger, will also become stronger in character, behavior, prosperity, happiness, and everything. What is the role of eugenics and Varnasram? Um, Varnasram, if you look at Varnasram, Varna is nothing but a grouping of similar instincts. We talked about special qualities and instincts when we're talking about man making. So, Sister Thakur Anukul Chandra says that every human being is unique. Every human being is born with distinct qualities, inborn instincts. So when similar instincts are combined, they become a varna, right? Eugenics is about superior human, su breeding of superior human beings. Behind the science of eugenics is the science of marriage. If you have ideal marriage, compat genetically compatible marriage, because science has taught us that, you know, there are 23 chromosomes and you know each come from the father and the mother and they form a zygote and these chromosomes out of this 46 only two determine the gender the rest determine the biological makeup of the child right because when the cell when the cell division happens when the millions of cells are formed each cell carries the same genetic code each cell carries the same characteristics and that leads to the biological makeup of the human being as Rishi Thakur calls it. And, uh, and when we talk about human superiority, when we talk about a uh, biological efficiency, that is dependent on eugenics and eugenics is dependent on ideal marriage. That's why Rishi Thakur Anukul Chandra has emphasized ideal genetically compatible marriage and the genetically compatible marriage, like the both the if, if the seed is the father and the soil is the mother, to have a great sapling which will sprout, great grow into a great tree, we need superior quality seed and superior quality soil, and that is compatible uh, union. So if compatible marriage happens, that will lead to you know better progeny. And that will lead to better human beings born with strong character. And if human beings have strong character and if they lead an ideal centric life, having a center, ideal at the center of their life, elevation of poverty is just a small thing. They will achieve many more things in their life. Hope that answers your question. Uh... Swati, Ms. Swati Sarkar. Thank you so much, uh, Mr. Surya. Okay, any other question? May I please get it on screen? How do you see the impact of presence of spiritual master in professional life? That is what uh, Mr. Manish Punjabi uh, is asking us. The impact of spiritual master in professional life. Manish, I love this question because I'm often asked this question. Being a professional myself, I'm always asked this question. And many a time people ask me, uh, well, how can you, how have you become a successful professional being spiritual? They probably don't see a relationship between the two. Of course, I don't claim that I become professionally successful, but whatever reasonable success I have achieved in my professional career, uh, uh, often people believe um, that you are spiritual. But to become professionally successful, you need to become aggressive. You need to become very, very, uh, you know, you need to be marching ahead. You need to sow aggression in your conversations, in meetings and discussions. As a leader, you need to demonstrate these traits. I tell them that um, I don't know much about that, but having a spiritual master at the center of my life, I have learned humility. I have learned empathy. I have learned how to love others. I have loved, I, I have understood interinterestedness. And I have loved, I have learned the art of collaboration. 
as a spiritual, uh, you know, as uh, following a spiritual master in my life, I have learned this trait from my master. And my dear friend, I asked the friend who asked me once, um, don't you think that you need to demonstrate empathy to your team members, to your customers every day? Don't you have to collaborate with your colleagues? Don't you have to demonstrate interinterestedness if you collectively want to succeed as an organization? Don't you need, don't you need to demonstrate love for your team members? Um, so I don't know about aggression, but I know that this traits that I have acquired through the teachings of my spiritual master, Sri Sri Thakur Anukul Chandra, they have immensely helped me, uh, an average human being like me, to become successful to whatever extent. Uh, and I, I give all credit to the spiritual master for that. And very recently, Mr. Surya, I was going through your LinkedIn profile and uh, and maybe you know my audience can also have a look at the LinkedIn profile of Mr. Surya and some beautiful comments uh, written by his ex-colleagues or managers, team members there, which shows uh, imp the impact of uh, Shushi Thakur, the spiritual guide in uh, Su Mr. Surya's life. And when I was reading actually uh, those messages, which is written, I was actually reflecting upon it that that is the impact of having a spiritual guide and you know, those messages were so, so beautiful which people have written for you on the you know, wall of linkedin so i thought i'll just you know talk about that as well though you were very humble enough to say that okay i have not made it so big but then i think if people go there people will understand what i'm talking about thank you so much. okay thank you so much uh yeah. any any other question which which we can take at this point because i think uh we are at time okay Mr. Deepak Kumar Das, what is the one sentence to sum up the path to remain most blissful? I think that is what people are looking for these days. Where is bliss? Where is happiness? Where is peace? <laughs> uh, Deepak Ji has, has asked a very, very uh, you know, profound question. What, and then he has asked me, he has given me the very difficult task of summing it up in one sentence. I understand bliss as happiness. So I remember what uh, I will not use my brain to answer this question. I will quote Sri Sri Thakur. Sri Sri Thakur says, give happiness to others. You will find happiness in plenty. Give peace to others. You will find peace in abundance. I believe that is the one best way to remain most blissful in life. What a beautiful message uh, to, uh, to bring our session today uh, to its end. Thank you so much, Mr. Surya. As always, I think whenever you join us, I think it feels very, it, it feels very much, you know, home because you are a family member of the you know, Cradle family. And, yes. uh, and so, you know, we always get to learn. And, and that way, you know, all the speakers we have got in our, as a part of a Cradle series have been really awesome. And in every session, I personally have learned a lot from you all. And it is my second session with you, uh, Mr. Surya, as a part of the series. Uh, so again, a great learning. And uh, I'm sure our audience has also got enriched. And most importantly, our audience have got to know about our spiritual guide, Sri Sri Thakur, his life, his teachings, his philosophy, and the elements which we need to learn from uh, the teachings of the great master. Uh, thank you so much, all of you. Uh, and I wish, I pray that the life and messages of the world teachers, like Shishi Thakur, let those lives and teachings keep inspiring us, keep guiding us, and keep, and let us keep uh, moving ahead, having a center in our lives, having Guru in our lives, and let us tread the path of life and growth. Thank you so much, all of you. Uh, wishing you lots of bliss, uh, happiness, peace, uh, lots of action. Uh, and uh, here, both uh, myself and Mr. Surya signing off uh, with a promise to come back again with another session from the House of Team Cradle. Thank you so much.
नमस्कार थैंक यू थैंक यू वेरी मच नमस्कार